Harmeet, I wanted to jump into some of your personal stories. So you're an Indian American, you're a woman, you're a super high profile lawyer. You're also a leader in the Republican Party, and then you live in California. So I would like to hear a little bit about some of the biggest challenges that you've faced and then how you've handled them. It could be in any one of those particular areas. Well, I grew up in a religious family. Um, my parents brought us here from India in the 1970s when India was really a socialist Soviet client state. and. You couldn't get electricity all day and you couldn't get anything done unless you were well connected, which we were, but they didn't want to live that way or have the government tell them how many children they could have. And so they brought us here. My dad finished his medical training as an orthopedic surgeon in New York. And then he wanted to bring his family to a rural community so that we could grow up with more traditional values. So I grew up in rural North Carolina where my dad was the only orthopedic surgeon in the whole county. Um, and at home, we used to pray together and you know be very very you know sort of focused on our values but also education as excellence uh, was important in my family as well as many uh, asian immigrant families and so when i was growing up i was always told you can do or be whatever you want this is america nothing will hold you back and also in my religion we believe in equality between the genders and so my mother was very active in our um, you know religious organization there in north carolina and nationally and so that was kind of how i was raised and then you kind of get a rude awakening when you go to college and everything is really, I went to Dartmouth College and, you know, people are very stratified and, you know, already back there in the 1980s, you know, sort of flying the badge of victimhood and women's oppression and, you know, not spelling woman, W-O-M-A-N, but, you know, various versions of that. So it was, it was really an eye opener, nothing like rural North Carolina for me. I became active in the newspaper there. Um, Dartmouth Review and, you know, went on to have a, a pretty uh, sort of career focused on conservative politics after that. But I will tell you the first big challenge I would say in a career setting was, um, frankly, being a young attorney. Um, to this day, women in the litigation field are far behind men in terms of equality, in terms of being able to achieve partnership, in terms of frankly, law firms being respecting of unique aspects of womanhood, including having children, um, you know, being part of a supportive marriage. And so I would say that was really my first experience of, uh, of glass ceilings, if you will. And it wasn't from being an Indian American, and I don't even really use the hyphenated language. It was just from being a woman. And I, I think that problem still persists to this day. And so all the slights and the harassment, sexual harassment and otherwise, and all the other things I experienced in these big law firms, I took those lessons and when I built my own law firm, which I'm the head of, you know, I tried to make it a, a place where we put family first and we respect people from their different backgrounds. I have, I have a more diverse law firm, I hate that word, but I have a more diverse law firm with Orthodox Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Sikhs than any of the law firms I ever worked at. And, um, you know, we really focus on excellence and on, on, you know, kind of those American ideals. And you remember what this country was founded on. This country was founded on equality and was founded on uh, not discriminating against people because of their views. And I tried to take that, take that lesson as I built my own successful law firm, which has now got 24 attorneys and five offices around the country in multiple jurisdictions. And so... This really is exciting this last few years. It has allowed us to help a lot more people and you know, have a lot of job satisfaction and being able to pick and choose what we do as a career. Hmm. Something I appreciate in how you answered that question is you didn't ignore the problem. Like these problems exist. It's not like we're just gonna gloss over it and say everything's fine, but you also didn't paint it in a picture of victimhood. Like no. problems happen. So then the question is how do we solve them? and make improvements and then move past that to to make things better instead of wallowing in oh poor harm right it's yeah, yeah. nobody should feel sorry for me i right, work exactly. around those problems I'm, yeah. I'm happy where i am right well if you could uh, have americans take a stand with you on any issue today uh, what would it be you're on the front lines of so many things that you are championing what's the number one thing that you think is so important for people to step up for and take a stand on so that's a difficult question because there are so many issues every day when i open up my 
X or Twitter. I look at, you know, what's at the forefront of the news. And I would say the existential crisis right now in our country is a bipartisan failure of elected officials to be responsive to their voters. Uh, we're seeing that with the speaker's race on the Republican side. We're seeing it with people getting into office, making promises, and then they just ignore their voters. Um, lobbyist capture by both parties on K Street lobbyists who just, you know, I mean, so many Republicans in my own party are making decisions based on their future lobbying contracts and, you know, defense industry issues as opposed to what the voters of their district want. And so now then you ask why? Well, there are a couple of reasons. There's a lot of money in politics and a lack of transparency. Uh, for most of my career, I've been opposed to term limits because, you know, I've, I do believe that uh, voters should have the right to choose outstanding candidates. But I wonder, there seems to be an intractable problem in D.C. that once people get elected, if they survive their first election, then they're there forever. You can't really can't get rid of them. It's virtually impossible. So that's a that's a challenge. Um, but I would say what we've seen in the last few years, and particularly the 2020 election, um, is the huge amount of money the left has put into corrupting the integrity of our elections with no corresponding response from the right. Mm. That exacerbates this problem because if you have, uh, you know, it's, it's almost unilateral disarmament by the Republican Party, not innovating in wow. litigation and lawfare and technology in uh, putting forth our own radical disruptive methods of making sure that elections are both widely accepted in terms of outcome and fair and auditable and accurate. And so I don't, I don't think our elections are fair right now. I don't think it is appropriate that many millions of Americans experience multiple ballots being sent to their homes. That is a recipe for fraud. Um, I saw it with my own two eyes what happened in the Arizona election of 2022 and machine failures and judges shrugging and doing nothing about it. And so the, that's, a, that's a problem I'd like to solve is that regardless of party, I want every citizen to feel like if they vote, their vote will be counted and it will matter. And we don't have that right now. We just don't have it. So that needs to be fixed before just about anything else. So, you, you know, John Eastman for making some questions and giving private advice to a client is, about to lose his bar license in California, if I had to guess. Um, that is tragic. The point of that is to deter lawyers like those in this conversation from getting involved, from representing clients. So the chilling effect on attorneys right. re in relation to election integrity litigation is itself a crisis. And I represent President Trump at my law firm, my partners do. And you know those efforts by judges and prosecutors are aimed squarely at lawyers like us. Right. Yeah, it's a really fascinating point. Um, so as I was talking to someone who's working on election integrity, and I talked about um, some of the efforts that he's doing, and I mentioned a state that happens to do well electing Republicans, and I said, you know, aren't aren't they doing a good job? And he said, no, there's a lot of corruption and issues with their election system that isn't their election system isn't in order. And he made an interesting point. He said. We aren't focused on the outcomes, like getting Republicans elected. We're focused on the system. We want the right results that what, the, to your point, Harmeet, who the people are electing, like what the vote outcome is, that's what we want. So if the people are selecting Democrats, Democrats get elected. If the people are selecting Republicans, Republicans get elected. We're not trying to game a system. We want integrity in the system. He said for four years, Hillary Clinton went around and said, the election is stolen, the election is stolen. And then we had 2020 and now Republicans are going around saying, the election is stolen, the election is stolen. He said, are we just gonna keep playing this ping pong game where you don't like the outcome and so then the other party starts screaming, there's problem in the system, or are we going to actually start fixing the systems? So everybody has confidence to your point, Harmi, that the existential crisis facing our country is that we no longer have confidence in the underlying system. And that's starting to erode the absolute fabric of the nation, that the elected leaders who know this as well aren't actually accountable to the people because maybe deep down they know the people aren't the ones fundamentally electing them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a real problem. And, and you know, I would love to see more Americans voting. 
I have a lot of young relatives. They don't feel like their vote really matters. They don't care. It just seems like a video game to them. And so, you know, and, and that's our fault as leaders um, who, you know, kind of shrug and think it's okay. I mean, to this day, although I think there were gross irregularities in the 2020 election, including but not limited to in Georgia, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and Arizona, uh, other, and Nevada, I can just reeling them off as a volunteer, I was involved in some of these, um, from not allowing observers to observe to openly defying state law as to who could vote by absentee ballot, looking at you, Wisconsin, um, to the use of drop boxes uh, and the abuse of them, Georgia. But elected officials, including Republicans in Georgia, um, will continue to gaslight the public and say, everything was fine. There's no evidence of irregularities there. There's, there's plenty of evidence and I think people need to be a little more honest with the voters if we want them to vote, and we do want mm -hmm. them to vote.